As always, I'm thankful to have this opportunity to speak to you. If you would be turning to the book of Genesis this morning, we'll spend a good bit of time there. Genesis chapter 6. Ultimately, under the heading of Romans chapter 15, verse 4, seeking to learn something from the Old Testament, for that is its purpose for us today. A few opening remarks about this chapter before we get to our text. In the first few verses of this chapter, Genesis chapter 6, we see that mankind throughout the time on the earth has become increasingly corrupt more and more corrupt we know we see that in verse 1 of this chapter that mankind has multiplied upon the face of the earth so he's grown in number we see that the sons of God that is those who were faithful to God looked upon the daughters of wicked men and saw that they were fair and as a result, ultimately, these once faithful men, faithful sons of God, sought after and chose heathen wives. A good picture of this would be similar to Samson with Delilah of Judges chapters 14 through 16. We see in verse 3 of this chapter that God has given mankind a time, an opportunity to repent. 120 years now we must note that this time frame is in tune with God's character he does not want any to perish 1st Peter chapter 3 verse 20 as well as 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 9 further detailing the wickedness and sinful condition of mankind we see that there were giants in the land, men of renown. These were wicked and violent men who were considered heroes of their day. We see this in verse 4. Now, each of us, especially those in America, should set up and take note of this, this concept. Who do we consider the heroes of our day? Most of the time, we would look to Hollywood to those similar to that, maybe actors, actresses, perhaps even singer-songwriters. Are the children born to us today admiring godly examples, or are they idolizing the violent and wicked creeps that we could find on TV? Nonetheless, God pronounces his righteous judgment upon the world. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 13, which we'll read at this time. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You see, throughout a full world of sin, there was only one man and his family that were remaining faithful to God. Verses 8 and 9. Due to his faithfulness, Noah was beneficiary of God's favor or his grace. Because of this, Noah received commandments of God. 
dealing with the destruction of the world. Which brings us to our first point. Noah received a call to build an ark. Verses 14 and through 16 of Genesis chapter 6. God there says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. We see that God gave specifics to Noah for this ark of protection. We see that Noah was made or caused or told rather to make an ark, to build an ark. Now the word ark is a Hebrew word, tabal, which means a box. Now this would stand in contrast to what we normally think of the ark as looking something more like a ship. But the Hebrew term is a box, a rectangular prism, especially given the dimensions that we just read. We see then that God told Noah to build an ark of gopher wood. Now this term gopher could refer to any of the following. Wood from a gopher tree, wood from a similar tree such as cypress or cedar, or it could also refer to a lamination process that utilizes multiple layers of thin sheets of wood. If you get an idea of that when you look at these columns holding up the, the roof here. There's multiple layers and they've been laminated to make a complete beam. There is no way for us to know exactly what this gopher wood was. After all, the flood changed the entire surface of the world. So it could be very possible that the wood that he used is no longer in existence. But no matter which kind of wood was used, whether it was a process or a specific kind of tree, Noah knew exactly what to do. Noah knew exactly what God expected, and he did it. We see that there were multiple rooms or nests that were to be built, to be made. These different rooms were used for storing the animals, obviously storing Noah and his family, as well as for storing all the food that would be needed. I would point out at this time, often skeptics point to the fact, well, how did Noah keep all the animals from eating each other? At this time, Noah didn't have to worry about that. Because everything in existence ate only vegetation. It was not until after the flood that God permitted the eating of meat. So everything in existence was a vegetarian. So naturally, all that Noah would have to provide was several green leaf salads. And everything on that ark would be satisfied. Then we come to the pitch. God told Noah that he must pitch within and without. Now this term is similar to what we would think of as tar or asphalt. Basically it was a water sealant. Now elaborating on these different concepts, we pulled a quote from the ISBE. There it says on page 1279, Gopher is a word unknown in Hebrew or allied languages. Lagarde considered that it was connected with gopherth, meaning brimstone, or pitch, while others connect it with kopher, also meaning pitch. Hence, along both lines, we reach the probability of some resinous wood and pine, cedar, and cypress have all had their supporters. A more probable explanation is that which connects gopher with the modern Arabic kufa, a name given to the boats made of interwoven willow branches and palm leaves with a coating of bitumen in outside, used today on the rivers and canals of Mesopotamia. 
In the Gilgamesh story of the flood, it is specifically mentioned that Noah daubed his ark both inside and out with a kind of bitumen. Going to a different quote. In the account of the ark, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, Kopher does not necessarily demote or denote vegetable pitch, but, what, but may well mean bitumen. The word slime occurs in the following passages. Genesis 11, verse 3, chapter 14, verse 10, as well as Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. Now each of the, the renderings of this word slime could very well be a reference to this bitumen. Now bitumen is a hydrocarbon that is allied to petroleum and natural gas. It is a lustrous black solid breaking with a conchoidal fracture basically just means it looks like a spiral when you break it in half burns yellow flame and it melts when ignited so if you're a chemistry major or minor this would be a fun thing to play with nonetheless Noah used it to make sure that this box that God commanded he build for a water sealant then we see that this box this ark had specific dimensions. It was to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Now the measurement of the cubit varies by basically whoever's measuring. But you, all, we, you will have to have some standard of a building. I measured my arm yesterday, and a cubit extends from the bottom of the elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Well, my cubit is a little bit over 20 inches. Well, the standard that the ISBE goes by was that the cubit at this time was 22 inches, which would make sense given that these pre-flood humans were more than likely larger than we are today due to a corrupted blood pool that we have. Either way, in terms of American units, I've heard them called freedom units, this arc would be, called, would be about 562 feet long, 93 feet wide, and 56 feet high. We see further that the arc had only one window, only one door, and three stories. Then we see that this arc, this box, had a very specific purpose. Galatians, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. You see, this ark was designed to work in the floodwaters. This box could withstand the force from those floodwaters. It would also serve to protect all who were inside. Both man and beast would be spared from the destructive floodwaters because of this ark. It would provide shelter and nourishment to all, all those inside. And there was enough food stored for that journey. So this ark made accommodation for that. And as we've re referenced earlier, man and beast ate only vegetation during this time period. Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 21. Returning to the ISBE, we have the following remarks. And I would aim this at many of the skeptics. Of course, it's useful for us to know and keep in mind because it is... God's inspired history of, a, of an account, and it means something for us. It is needless to speculate upon the, the capacity of the ark for holding absolutely all the species of animals found in the world, together with the food necessary for them. Since we are only required to provide for such animals as were native to the area to which the remnants of the human race living at that time were limited, and which may not have been large. 
but calculations show that the structure described contained a space of about 3 million cubic feet. And that after storing food enough to support several thousand of pairs of animals. Of the average size, on an, o an ocean voyage of a year, there would remain about 50 cubic feet of space for each pair. No mention is made in the Bible of a pilot for the ark, but it seems to have been left to float as a derelict upon the waters. For that purpose, its form and dimensions were perfect. As long ago demonstrated by the celebrated navigator, Sir Walter Raleigh, who notes it had, quote, a flat bottom and was not raised in the form of a ship with a sharpness forward to cut the waves for the better speed. A construction which excuse me, secured the maximum of storage capacity and made a vessel which would ride steadily upon the water. Numerous vessels after the pattern of the ark, but of smaller dimensions, have been made in Holland and Denmark and proved admirably adapted for freightage where speed was not of the first importance. They would hold one-third more lading than other vessels and would require no hands to work them. The gradual rise and subsidence of the water, each continuing for six months, and their movement inland render the survival of such a structure by no means unreasonable. It's almost as if God had a plan in the dimensions he gave Noah. Throughout the account of the flood, we see that this ark was successful. Secondly, we ask, who would actually be saved by the ark? Genesis chapter 6, verses 19 through 22. There it says, And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them all alive. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. You see, only those who were inside the ark would be saved at the time of the flood. Noah and his family were the only humans saved. Throughout the allotted time, this period of 120 years, we see that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Thus it can be properly stated that God allowed for those of the world to repent of their wickedness before he would destroy the world. Unfortunately, the masses did not listen. They would not repent. We see that various kinds of animals were saved at God's command. There are 14 of each clean beast and fowl, and two of each unclean beast, pairs of male and female. Genesis chapter 7, verses 2 through 3. We point to the fact that an obedient faith was necessary to save all those in the ark. This was not a leap of faith as many would claim today. Kind of blindfold yourself or cover your eyes with your hand and just make a jump. No. Noah acted by faith. He relied on the trust he had for God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet as seen, or not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You see, God had given him ample evidence to show Noah that he was, in fact, Jehovah God. And Noah acted on this evidence. He could have ignored God's call. In fact, his faith would be tested by two statements. First, God's claim to destroy the earth and all flesh. Verse 13 of Genesis 6. And secondly, the method of destruction, that is, water. You see, Noah, nor anyone alive at this time, had ever seen rain. Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, there says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, 
For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So no rain had a, a come across the earth at this time. So when God says, I'm going to destroy the world and I'm going to use water to do it, Noah's faith was put to the test. Due to his faithfulness, due to the faithfulness of his family, they were spared from the coming destruction. When the floods came, it was God himself who closed them in the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. The latter phrase there, and the Lord shut him in. God sealed this box. There was no way for them to be taken from this ark of safety. There was no way for the waters of destruction to come in and condemn them as well. For God sealed this box. Now what did this ark of Noah's day point to? Our third point. Noah's ark brought salvation in his day. Today... The church is the vessel of spiritual safety that God has prescribed. We have already pointed out that Noah was commissioned to build one ark. Christ, the very Son of God in the flesh, promised to build only one church. His church, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. This would be the one body of the saved, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. The church and the body are synonyms. They're one and the same. They describe different aspects of one institution. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 22, or 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Salvation is only in one name. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Then we see that the ark needed pitch, just as we in the vessel of safety do today. Now, what do we mean by this? As we've read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, but we'll read it again, this term comes up. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch, that is, kofar, it within and without with pitch, kofar. So there's two different words here for the term pitch. Kofar, which is what we've spent a good, deal, good bit of time discussing, would be the the uh, hydrocarbon used as a water sealant, but thou shalt pitch, kafar, means to cover or atone. Compare this with Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. This Hebrew word kafar appears twice in this verse as atonement. Thus, the pitch that covered the ark both inside and out acted, acted as atoning blood for all those inside the ark and thus would not allow not even one drop of judgment to come in through that ark. Today we have the access of a, of a, or to atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Referencing also Romans chapter 3, verses 25, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Because of this atoning blood, the ark was a perfect place for safety and security. The ark was watertight, thus was the perfect shelter in a worldwide flood. All inside were secured from the surrounding waters. Since God closed the door, they were safe. Again, Genesis 7, verse 16. Today, we are added to the church by God upon complying with the gospel. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Through remaining faithful, we obtain, we obtain our eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter 9, verses 12, and 27, and 28. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. There he states, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
As we pointed out earlier, Noah's ark had but one door. Genesis 6, verse 16. Through this one door, all humans and animals entered in. There was no other way to enter this ark of safety. The vessel of safety today, the church, has only one door, and that is Jesus Christ. Thus, there is only, point, or there is only one point of entrance to that church. There is no other way in. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. There, Jesus boldly claims that I am the door. Verse 9, By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. What a great comfort that would be to sheep. And it should be a comfort to us as Christians who are metaphorically those sheep. Entering through this door provides an escape from the sins and the cares of this world. It is the only way to God. John chapter 14, verse 6, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, as well as 20, uh, verses 21 through 23. But this flood should cause us to ask the question, why did God use water to destroy the world? Is there anything special with H2O? I believe we have the scriptural reason for that, that flood in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the, res by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the flood of Noah's day foreshadowed water baptism found in the New Testament. This baptism is a prerequisite in becoming a Christian. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. As well as chapter 22, verse 16. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And Titus chapter 3, verse 5. This worldwide flood of Noah's day destroyed the sinful world. When, the finally, when finally those waters receded, what was left? What remained? A world that was made new. You see, when a person is baptized for the remission of their sins, this is exactly what happens to them. Baptism makes a new creature, that is, a Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Upon being converted and being baptized, that old life of sin is put to death. Then we see that the ark shows us the depth of God's love and wrath. God provided a way of escape from the death of the world by the ark. He does not want any to perish. John chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Unfortunately, the masses will not heed God's warning. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And then consider Matthew chapter 25. We're given three parables there showing how most of the world will be unprepared. We see it in the five virgins, the unprofitable servant, as well as the goats on the left. Many will die unprepared for eternity. Though his love was shown in the ark, the flood shows God's righteous wrath. When man turns to his own way, it only leads to death. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Chapter 16, verse 25. And consider Romans chapter 1. When man refuses to follow God's laws, we deserve spiritual death. And also physical death. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. I would point out verse 31 at this time, though time is getting away from us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, the vast majority of those in existence on the earth of, of Noah's day found out just how fearful 
a thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. We have the benefit of looking back and hopefully learning something from the Old Testament. We've had that opportunity this morning in learning from the flood of Noah's day. We've pointed out that in this day of Noah, the world lied in wickedness to the point that God needed to destroy the earth and all those on it. Even in his righteous wrath, however, he offered a way of salvation to any and all who would actually obey his word. God has given us a way of salvation today, that is, the gospel of Christ. If you would like to obey the gospel of Christ this morning, why not do so? Why not take these few moments that we have to obey the gospel of Christ, to ultimately be baptized for the remission of your sins, putting to death that old manner of living, and become a new creature, becoming a Christian. By being baptized, you'll be added by the Lord himself to this ark of safety, the church that Jesus bought and built himself. As a child of God, however, have you allowed sin into your life? If so, why not repent of that wickedness today and contact the saving blood of Christ once more to have that sin remitted and erased from your life? If either of these needs apply to you, please make them known as together we stand and sing.